Today we're going to continue and conclude chapter 15 here. And we're going to be looking at a parable. It's been referred to as a parable of the prodigal son. I, I chose to refer to this as the lost sons because, in fact, it's not just the one boy that we know so well by the term prodigal, but he has an older brother, and they're both, they're both lost. It's not just the prodigal. It's actually the two sons that are lost. And so we're going to be looking at that today. So let me begin reading to you here in Luke chapter 15 at verse 11. And I'll read the entire parable to you and then give you a, an introduction and move into our study. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. No one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who, was, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed a fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. And so last time we were together, let me lay a foundation for you before we move into this and kind of develop some things for you. The last time we were together, we looked at we were looking at chapter 15, and we saw how Jesus was speaking to a large group of people. When we looked at chapter 14, verse 25, Luke had said a great multitude went with him. So Jesus is speaking to a large group of people. And uh, the people that he was speaking to included, according to chapter 15, verse 1, tax collectors and sinners, as well as verse 2, and Pharisees and scribes. And so this is a large crowd it, that had a group of religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes. But there were also less respectable people there. Uh, Luke specifically mentions them as tax collectors and sinners. And, and last time we were together, I, I mentioned to you that, uh, that both the groups, the tax collectors and sinners, were despised. They were despised members of Jewish society. Tax collectors were hated because they, uh, they worked for pagan Rome and they would collect taxes from their own people. And the sinners were despised because they were unconcerned with religion and they were outrageous in the way that they lived. So when the Pharisees saw these people there with Jesus, they, they got upset and their, rea their reaction was negative. In verse 2 it tells us they complained that, that Jesus received sinners and actually ate with them. 
I mentioned to you that receiving, when it says he received, that word receiving uh, speaks of warm, warmly welcoming them. And eating with them spoke of enjoying fellowship with them. And so they felt that Jesus was, was a man of similar character. He was like them. And, and that's the only reason that he'd have anything to do with these people. And because of that attitude, Jesus gave a couple of parables. Or actually, this would be, some have regarded this as a single parable with three parts. But he began to speak to them, and he began to share with them in verses 1 through 7 about a shepherd who is searching for a lost sheep. And then in verses 8 through 10, he continued by speaking of a woman searching for a lost coin. Now, both of these illustrations em emphasize something that was lost. And, and it also emphasized that someone was searching for that which was lost. You see, neither the sheep nor the coin would be aware of being lost. They needed to be found. So in the first two sections, we saw how God searches for those who are far from him. And that's because God is the God who seeks for the lost because he wants to rescue and recover. Well, at this point, Jesus continues revealing God's passionate love for the lost. But this time he speaks of lost sons. He speaks of a prodigal. That prodigal represents the tax collectors and sinners. But he speaks of an older brother, and the older brother is self-righteous. He's a picture of the Pharisees. Now, as we look at this particular parable, uh, you might find this interesting. This parable was the center of debates during the Middle Ages. It was referred to by Muslim scholars when they were debating with Christians, and in debates they often used this parable as evidence against Jesus Christ being Messiah. Now, how would they do that? How would they use this parable to oppose Christianity? Well, this is what they do. They would point out that the son left home. He went to live in a foreign land. He got in trouble. He decided to return. And when he arrived home, he was welcomed. And his return was celebrated. So they argue he simply returned home. He was welcomed back by a loving father. There was no incarnation. There's no savior. It's just a young man deciding to return home. Well, that accords with... Uh, uh, Islam, because if someone wants to convert to Islam, it's a simple thing to do. I, I wanted to see that, and I wanted to take something from one of the <laughs> one of the sites that that give you information on Islam that is put out by Muslims. I wanted to quote their own source, and so I looked at and I looked it up. I said, "How does one convert to Islam?" And so I went to a page, and this is what was written. It says, "To convert to Islam." You simply say and believe that there is no God except Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger. Once you say this, you automatically become Muslim. From there, you start carrying on with the duties of Islam. And so to be converted to Islam simply is a statement. There, there's no sense of repentance, really. There's simply an agreement that something about uh, Allah and Muhammad. And that's basically how they convert. And so... They would use that mentality as they were speaking concerning this particular parable. And they would say there's no Messiah. There's no sense of, of repentance. He just returns and he's welcomed. And they would use that in debate. How did the Christian scholars deal with that? Well, I'm going to give you that perspective today. I'm going to share some things with you about how Christian scholars presented this particular parable uh, when they would argue that Jesus Christ is Messiah. And that's what we'll be doing as we look at this, this, eve, this morning. So in verses 11 and 12, we'll begin there. A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. So I'm going to start laying a foundation. We'll move to application in a moment. So the younger man in the story tells his father, to give him his portion of his inheritance. The son was within his rights as an heir to request his inheritance this way. The problem that's being pointed to is his heart is not right towards his father. In requesting his inheritance, he was insulting not only the father, but also the older brother. So that reveals a lack of honor for the father, and it also reveals a lack of love for others. We know that he wanted to use the money to get away from his father and to be free from his father's interference. He intended to take the money and to use it that he could party. So that reveals him to be selfish and without restraint or concerned for the feeling, feelings of others. His chosen lifestyle 
would have brought great shame to his father, but he didn't care. In Proverbs 17, 21, it says, He who begets a scoffer does so to his sorrow, and the father of a fool has no joy. And so that's what Jesus is illustrating here, that this young man did not honor his father and was a scoffer, was rejecting the love and grace of his father. He was selfish, and he was out, was with, out restraint. Now, on the part of the father, Jesus makes it clear that he was a kind and caring man. You see, in the Jewish way of life, leaving an inheritance was something expected. It revealed a proper understanding of the blessings of God on the parents. And godly parents knew the source of their blessings, and they wanted to be blessings to their children. So it demonstrated them to be loving and generous when they provided for the future of their kids. And so he's asking for his inheritance. In Proverbs 13, 22, it reads, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Proverbs 19, 14, houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers. So now, he could ask for it, but requesting the inheritance before the father died was unthinkable. What he did would be greatly offensive to traditional Jews. By asking for it while his father was alive, he was simply saying this to his dad. He was saying, I cannot wait until you're dead. Now, when he said, I want my inheritance, it would have been expected of the father to slap him in the face, to drive him out of the house. And he would not have been expected to fulfill that. He would have been expected to refuse the request. But as you see in this parable, he doesn't refuse it. Notice how it says in verse 12, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Instead of driving him out, he divides the inheritance. And notice again, Jesus made it clear that he divided to them his livelihood. Both the younger and the elder brother received their portion. He didn't just give the one asking, he also gave to the one who was not asking. And that emphasizes grace and generosity. Again, Jesus made it very clear that this man is a very, very wealthy man. He has a home that you can have a, a large group of people in, uh, large enough to eat an entire calf in one night. It's kind of like my family. He had servants. He could afford to hire a band for dancing. He had herds of cattle and goats. He's a very, very rich man. And so when the division of the inheritance comes. That's a large amount. And under Jewish law, the older brother could receive two-thirds and the younger would receive one-third according to Deuteronomy 21.17. That means that the older brother's inheritance was enormous. And so he's dividing his inheritance to them. In verse 13, not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. And so he liquidated his assets as quickly as he could. He sold everything and got out of town. That created greater shame for the father because the community now knows there's a breach between the father and the son. You see, the son should not sell the property until the father dies if he ever does. So he has shamed his father by selling the land while his father's alive and able to farm it. But selling quickly was necessary because anger in the village has risen against him. And the father allows this to occur, though it brings shame to him in the community. You see, as he leaves, he knows that he's not to lose any portion of the inheritance to Gentiles. Because if he does, he will be punished by excommunication from the community. There was a rite at that time that's called ketzatza. And that's excommunication. A jar would be filled with burned corn, nuts, was broken in front of the individual. The community would shout, so-and-so is cut off from his people, and he would never be spoken to again. So this boy knows that in making this request, he needs to liquidate the assets and get out of town because he's going to be excommunicated. That's why he's hurrying out, and that's why he's leaving. And this is a picture, as Jesus is presenting this parable, this is a picture of sin. You're broken off from God, and you're broken off from people. Sin makes separation between you and God, but it also makes separation between you and others. And so that's the picture here. So he's aware of this. 
He sells everything. He leaves as quickly as possible. He gathers everything together, according to verse 13. He journeys to a far country. When it speaks of journeying to a far country, he's leaving Israel and he goes into a foreign land. It reveals that sin will drive you from a loving father into a world that is away from God. In 1 John 2, 16, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And so Jesus is speaking of this young man moving out in sin into the world, giving himself over to it. And he says he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. The word wasted means to squander. The word prodigal speaks of riotous or wasteful. So he squandered his possessions with riotous, wasteful living. The word prodigal, by the way, doesn't speak of sexual immorality. It speaks of irresponsibility, irresponsible living. In verse 30, we saw that the, the older brother said that this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots. Well, that's an angry brother speaking there. There's no, no um, uh, actual proof that he had done such a thing. He was living irresponsibly. He was mad, this older brother. He came from the field. He's exaggerating his brother's failures. And that happens very often when someone's mad at you. They exaggerate the things that you've done. But it goes on, it says in verse 14, when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. As it often happens... In his run from his father, he ended up starving. He came to see that the life that he thought he would have didn't appear. He thought the good life would last forever, but the money runs out. Eventually, the life he was living ran dry, and his so-called friends disappear. You know, you've discovered that. I discovered that when I was living in the world, and uh, as a non-believer, as I was far from God myself, as long as you had something, there's always going to be a friend. You know, the way we used to do it at that time was, I have a car, and you've got the dope. I'll give you a ride if you give me some weed. That was how we did things. We were always bargaining. And if I had something that somebody else wanted, like when I'd buy a kilo, there would be people around. I always had friends when I had weed. But when I didn't have weed, I was there sponging off of somebody else. I was trying to find what they had. That's what you do in the world, right? I'm, you use one another. If you have something, I'll bargain with you. You need a ride, I want some pot, or whatever the case may have been with you. It and happens, but when things dry up, when you don't have anything anymore, your friends also leave. They're not around either. Like it says in Proverbs 19.4, Wealth makes many friends. Poverty drives them all away. As long as this man had money, he would always have friends. But when his money dried up, so did his friendships. Well, at that point, he desires to return. He doesn't have any money. He wants to recover it because if he returns home without money, he will be excommunicated. And so he's in want. In verse 15, he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. And so he joined himself in verse 15. That word joined means to attach himself. He was depending on this guy. He was holding on tightly to this person. He's famished. So he's dependent on the man to help him. So this arrogant son of a highly respected wealthy man has been completely reduced. He's now depending on a Gentile, a man outside of the promises of God. And he's trying to come up with ways to save enough money to go home. He's trying to work hard enough to save an amount that he can never attain. He can never attain the amount that he's already lost. And the only thing he's got right now is caring for swine. And he's starving so much he wants to eat the pig food. That's what he wants to do. He has no way to recover anything. He's in complete destitution. And that's, again, a picture 
How can I come to faith? How can I have a relationship with God? I can't have a relationship with God if I try to work hard enough to gain that. There's no amount of work I can do, any human being can do. This is what the gospel teaches. There's nothing good that I can do that's good enough. It's never enough. I can't give to God what it requires. That's the whole point. God had to do a work for us that we could not do for ourselves. We could not pay the debt that we owed. So God took upon himself human form and he paid the debt himself. And that's how Christianity is. And that's the point that the Christian, Christian scholars would be making to the Muslim scholars, that there's grace involved here. There's, there's a debt that cannot be repaid. And that's what's taking place. And that's why God is going to take upon himself human form and carry that load for us. And so he's holding tightly to this Gentile because he's not holding tightly to his father. He's trying to come up with ways to save up enough to go home. He's trying to work hard enough to save the amount, but he can never attain that. What's he do? He gets a job feeding pigs, which is the lowest this Jewish man could ever sink to. And verse 16 says, no one gave him anything. So he's tending pigs for meals and no pay. And this is a picture of an unrepentant person trying to save himself to replace what he had lost himself. Well, in verse 17, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. This is where many normally say the young man repented. It says he came to himself. But is this really a picture of repentance? And, and I'd have to say not necessarily because it flies in the face of the previous words Jesus had spoken of the sheep and the coin. Remember, Jesus said someone looked for and found the lost sheep. Someone looked for and found the lost coin. They didn't find themselves. Well, he comes up with a plan in verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so this is where people say, see, he's repenting, but... This is a rehearsed speech. Notice what he said. I've sinned against heaven and before you. Is this genuine repentance? Perhaps not. If you read your Bible in the book of Exodus, Pharaoh said this to Moses when requesting the eighth plague to be lifted. In Exodus 10, 16 and 17, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. He was just trying to buy time there in the book of Exodus, and that's what this young boy is doing too. This is a way to get back home. He's going to work. He's going to get money. He's going to leave again. So his solution is to hire on as a servant, get job training, gain the money back. In other words, this is a way of saying he's planning on saving himself. He doesn't evidence concern over his father's shame. He doesn't evidence concern over his father being humiliated. And he doesn't care about his broken heart. You see, salvation is rooted on our coming to see that we have sinned against God. It, it's not simply a way to have a more comfortable life. Today, there are quite a number of people who are professing to be Christians who haven't repented. They haven't really turned from their sin. They go to church. Perhaps they go at certain times. You know, they'll, they'll go on Easter, they'll go on Christmas, they'll go at various times for weddings and baptisms and the like. And, and, and when spoken to, they'll say, well, yeah, I'm a, a believer in Christ and all. But when you begin to dig into their life and all, have you ever found a place where you repented of your sin, wherever you said, God, forgive me a sinner, I, I, I need to be right with you. I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. And many people say, no, not, no, not really, but I've gone through religious training or I've gone to church. That's kind of what's taking place here. He, he's not revealing genuine repentance. He's revealing a scheming heart. So in verse 20, he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and broke it. No. <laughs> oh, you are listening. Okay. <laughs> fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. And so he begins to speak to him. 
Notice it says he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off. He's thinking of the community rejection, as well as the lecture he's about to endure. He's returning home empty-handed after insulting his family and community. Now, why did he come home in the first place? Because he's hungry. I've discovered that God can use our physical needs to awaken us to spiritual needs. To the woman at the well who had come to get some water, Jesus said to her, if she drinks of that water, she's going to thirst again. And he began to share with her that he could give to her living water. There was a cripple on a mat who was unable to walk. His four friends brought him to Christ, dug, dug, opened up a, uh, the roof and placed him before Christ. The cripple on the mat had a need to walk, but Jesus knew that his real need was first forgiveness. So the physical need can lead you to the spiritual answer. And this man's hunger and pride drove him home. It also served to awaken him to what was missing, and it began to humble him. I want you to notice again in verse 20, it says he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off. He was still a great way off. The distance isn't just physical. It's spiritual. He's a great way off from the Lord. He's far away from God. The Bible says sin makes a separation between you and your God. And sin had made a separation between him and the Father. And that separation was more than simply distance. The sheep was a ways off. The coin was not in sight. And the man is a distance away. And that's a picture of us being lost and separated. In Ephesians 2.17, it speaks of Jesus coming and preaching peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. So sin makes a distance between you and God. There are times that you may be saying, God, I need help. And how come heaven seems to be like brass and my words seem to be just going as far as the ceiling and dropping at my feet? Because there's sin involved and, and sin has to be resolved. It has to be dealt with. And there's a distance until that is resolved. But as this is all taking place, verse 20 says, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So the father was waiting for him looking for him to appear on the road that led into town. Just waiting. Just waiting. Why? Because if the townspeople saw his son and got to the son before the father, that they would excommunicate him. He would not see his son again. And so he waited there. And this is the picture. He's waiting and he's looking over the road that would lead into town. And he's just waiting patiently waiting, waiting for his son to come home. As I was going through this, I made a note to myself, like my mom did when she would look out of the window waiting for me. My, my house that I grew up in, my father had, uh, had an addition to the kitchen that had two bay windows. And I can still remember as I was in my car, 2, 2.30 in the morning, bloated, not wanting to go into the house because the light was on. And I didn't want to go in until the lights were all off. And I can still remember sitting in my car, watching the light, waiting for it to go off. And then my mom walking up and looking out the window for her lost son. I can still remember that, watching her as she was looking out the window for me. And this is a picture of what I see the father doing for the son. He's there looking and, and waiting for him to come and make his appearance. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And so the father's there looking, and he's waiting for him. And it says in verse 20, when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. His father gathered up his robe in his hands and he runs out to meet him. He needs to get to the sun before the villagers or else he'll be banished. And notice he doesn't wait for the speech. He loves him before a word came out of his mouth. 
Middle Eastern men never ran in public while wearing long robes. It was humiliating. And in Middle Eastern culture, the father would wait in the home for the son to publicly beg forgiveness. And so when the Muslims were saying there's no incarnation, there's no need for God to take upon himself human flesh, this is a picture of the incarnation. In Philippians 2, 5 through 8, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. This is a picture of Jesus coming and taking upon himself human flesh. And this father's humiliation is a picture of Christ seeking out the lost. Out of love, he emptied himself of his prerogatives. He assumed the form of a servant. He made haste to rescue his estranged son. And he saved him from those who would banish him forever. And as a father runs in humiliation to reconcile the sinner, he's a picture of God in Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he is rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And so as the father is running, the son's watching him as he comes running to him, and he sees his father humiliating himself in public, and it touches him. And so as he sees his father in verse 21, the son says to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He doesn't go on with his plan. Notice that he doesn't say, therefore make me a servant. His plan is now being thrown away. The voluntary humiliation of the father touched the son. It caused him to honestly confess and forsook his plan for job training. This is honest repentance. There's no schemes, just in a response to an amazing love that has been offered. But the father in verse 22 says, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. They began to be merry. I should add one point to verse 21 before I move into that. I want you to see this with me. The son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in your sight I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Before I came to faith in Christ, I brought shame to my father, my, my earthly father. I don't want to go into a lot of garbage you don't need to know. But I did embarrass my father. When I grew up, I don't know what your upbringing was like. I had a father and a mom. Some of you didn't have a dad. Some didn't have both. I understand. But in my case, I had a father and a mom. My mom taught me from the time I was very little to respect my father. That's what my mom taught me, honor your father. And you know what my mom used to say to me? She would say, son, your dad's name is respected. Honor your father because you carry his name. That's how my mom would speak to me. I don't know how yours would speak to you, but that's how my mom spoke to me. You're a Rosales. Your father is respected. Bear that name with dignity. That's what my mom used to say to me because people respect your dad. And if you take his name and bring shame to it, she said, that's a very bad thing. I learned that from being a little boy, shaming your father's name. That's a big thing to me to this day. It's a big thing to me to shame your father's name. I don't want to shame my heavenly father's name. But I can remember when my father died. I can remember we were sitting in that waiting room. Many of you have heard this. I'll make this brief. But I remember sitting in the waiting room and then the doctor telling us they did their best, but he's, he's gone. And then they brought us into the room, the ICU room there, in Chino Hospital. And I stood, my father's body before me, my father's head was to my left, and, and I stood close to him. My mama stood next to me, and I'm looking at the shell because I know that 
absent from the body is present with the Lord. And I know dad is with Jesus. I knew that. But as I and some of my family stood there, I still remember the first thing that came out of my mouth. I still remember as I looked at my father and I reached over and I, and I touched his, his hair and I, I, I caressed my father's head and I still remember saying, Daddy, I shamed you and I'm so sorry. I brought shame to your name. That was the first thing that came out of my heart. First thing, I brought shame to your name. I am so sorry. Now, I had already told him that. I had, I had changed. My life was serving the Lord. I had brought my dad to faith in Christ, my mom to faith in Christ. My life was not the same as it was prior to being saved. But in your heart, you can still carry things like that. And it comes out at times you wouldn't even expect it. And there I was looking at my father and the first thing that came out of my mouth was sorrow of not being the kind of son I should have been. And the next thing I said was, the Lord gives and the Lord taketh away. And my mom who was standing right next to me looking at a husband of 53 years, my mom had married my father when she was 17 years old, one month past her 17th birthday. She was a mother of two by the time she was 19. She had lived all of her little girl life to her older age with this one man, 53 years. Her entire life was this man outside of Jesus. And I said, the Lord gives and the Lord taketh away and mom, right here at my shoulder, said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Those are memories you carry. I will carry those to my grave. That you can have done things that come out. And, and in, in my conversion, if I may, what caused me to be open to the new life that Christ can give was the sense of Conviction that God placed in my heart of what a lousy son I had been and what a lousy person I was. When I got saved, I didn't say, oh, it was other people's fault. See, my mom was ill all of my life since I was four or five years old. My mom would take medication when I was six, seven years old and mom, mama would drink sometimes with the medication and she'd go into a rage and she could be abusive. And, she, you know, my dad didn't know that my mom did some of the things that she did and said some of the things that she said. My dad didn't know that. She didn't tell him. None of us did. So it was one of those quiet secrets in the house that mom could be mean. She can fly off, fly off the handle. She can kick you. She can call your names. There was a period in my life where my mom told me she hated me more than she ever said, I love you. That was my mom. And you know, you make excuses for her. You say, well, you know, she's sick. My dad used to tell me that all the time. Your mom was ill. Your mom was ill. You have to show her concern. And we did. But those are things that are wounds that stay inside of you. And so I had lived a crazy life. And when I got to the point where I realized that my life was ruined and I was ruining other people and there was no joy in me and there was nothing but anger and, and hurt and, and meanness. I, I, you know, that's where I finally got to the point where I said, God, I'm miserable and, and I'm making others miserable with this anger that's inside of me. And that's why when the Spirit of God convicted me by the Holy Spirit's movement in my sin, I didn't make an excuse. I didn't say, well, you know, my dad was an absent father my, emotionally. My, my, my mom was abusive. You know, I didn't make those excuses. I just said, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. It's on me. It's on me. And I need help. And that's how I got saved. You see, there was no scheming. There was no, well, you know, it's other people's fault. And, and, and I didn't get a good break. And if I'd have only, it wasn't anything like that. And that's what this prodigal is doing here. He had originally had a plan. His plan was make me a servant. That way I can save up some money and take off again. But when he saw his father running with his robe lifted, humiliated in front of any who could see him. It broke this young man. And to know that our God took upon himself human flesh and dwelt amongst men so we could behold his glory, 
It causes people to realize what a great God and loving Father we really have when we're so far away from Him doing things that are wasteful and making everybody in our family and God Himself look bad. He's still waiting patiently. He's just waiting. And the moment there's a movement towards Him, He rushes to you. And then he grabs the son and he holds him. And you can almost see this where the father's just holding tightly to his son. So if anybody were to come in and try try and break it up, any of the community said, that's that's the boy that we've excommunicated. The father was holding him, embracing him tightly so that no one could get to the son. And that's what Jesus did for you. He took you in his arms and he held you close to his chest. And no one can get to you because they'd have to go through him first. And that's the God that we serve, the God who protects and loves us and recovers us. And so this is what happens is as this takes place, in verse 22, the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put, put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, bring the fatted calf here, kill it, let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be married. Let us celebrate. He was lost and is found. He's, he didn't say he's lost and has come home. He said he is lost and is found. Who found him? Jesus. While well, he was still a great way off. Like the sheep and like the lost coin, it took someone to find him. He gives him the best robe. He gives him a ring and he gives him sandals. So the best robe, he's clothed with status. A ring, he's given authority. Sandals, he's given freedom. This is a picture of salvation. And the fattened calf is slaughtered. It's slaughtered for the most important guest. And it's a picture of complete sacrifice that leads to celebration. As this is all taking place, verse 25, the oldest son is in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music, dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. He said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Well, the elder brother hears the sound of celebration. What's going on? Why well, your brother's reconciled with your father and the community. His father's humiliation resulted in reconciliation. Well, this is being a Christian, being reconciled to God, and being reconciled to your community. In Proverbs 16, 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. So he says, your brother has come in because he's received him safe and sound. We're celebrating. Not only is he in health, but he has come to a place of peace with his father. But verse 28 tells us he was angry. He would not go in. Therefore, his father came out, pleaded with him. He doesn't want to hear that he's welcomed home safe. He wanted him punished, and it makes him angry, and he lashes out in public at his father. He refuses to come in. He refuses to participate, and this was an unspeakable insult to the father. He's angry that his father didn't make the younger brother pay for his sin. He goes, therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Culturally, the father would have been expected to ignore the insult and to deal with it in private. But by going out, once again, he's humiliating himself in front of people. Instead of, instead of being angry and all, he shows grace to the one who thinks he's keeping the law, even as he showed grace to the one who knew he was breaking it. And in verse 20, 29, he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as the son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed a fatted calf for him. So he's very angry. I've been serving you all my life. I have never disobeyed. He's self-righteous. This is unbelievable, frankly. He already had been assigned two-thirds of the estate when it was divided. So what is this? This is a rebuke to the Pharisees. They're the older brother. Self-righteous. Unable to rejoice when a sinner is saved. These are the Pharisees who, according to verse 2, complained. This man is receiving sinners and eating with them. It was the Pharisees that Jesus is speaking to. And he's saying, listen, when somebody is found, you ought to rejoice. When these people, these tax collectors and, 
and these, and these sinners, when they come and sit at a table and hear the goodness of God coming from my lips, Jesus was saying, instead of rejoicing when they become followers of God, what you do is you get upset because they don't, they don't fit your idea of what a believer should look like. You're self-righteous. Aren't you glad that God accepted you? I'm glad that he accepted me. I'm telling you. And there are people who are saying, oh, things are so different now than they, they were when you got saved. That's not true at all. That's not true at all. Things are pretty much the same. Things are pretty much the same. Where people are lost and they need, to, they need to be found. There's rebellion. There's anger. There's a lack of love. There's open sin. I mean, they need Jesus Christ. And, and uh, you know, when I got saved, it's a long hair. They, there, were, there were people who, who didn't want to hear us. They didn't want to hear us speak. You know, what, what many of you younger people may not realize, and, and how would you, um, you know, what is normal for you today was completely abnormal in the Jesus movement. When, when people like me with long hair and bare feet and, and you know, hippie-type kids, when we were coming to faith in Christ, not only was the public rejecting us, but so was the church. The church, the church didn't like the fact that we were, they called us undisciplined. They said we were bringing voodoo music into the church. They thought that we were, were just wild-eyed uh, fanatics who were going to just, you know, evaporate in time. They, they didn't have the ability to really understand that God could reach into that community of, of people that were the unwashed hordes and could actually save them. And there are many believers who, were, who would watch you and would wonder whether, when are you going to go back to the vomit? When are you going to go back to the mud? They would watch you, and they would expect that from you because you didn't look like them. And they didn't know how to rejoice. They didn't know how to rejoice when some hippie kid would come walking forward at an invitation because they were so busy looking at his feet because he didn't have shoes on that they didn't see that he was about to enter into the kingdom of God. You know, and that's the one thing that I bless God, to be honest with you, for my pastor Chuck Smith, who said one day when, when the hippies were coming in with bare feet, I never wore shoes, and we would come to church barefooted, and when we walked in, and his, he had just put new carpet in, and his elders wanted to, to, to remove the, uh, well, they actually put a sign on the door saying, no shoes, no entrance, and Chuck happened to come early, and he removed that sign, and he took these men aside, these ushers aside, and he said, if this carpet keeps one kid from coming into this sanctuary, then I'm in favor of removing the sanctuary carpeting so we can get that one kid saved and that's what pastor chuck was like and i still agree with that you know what let's not worry about the outside because god has a way of cleaning up the inside and when the inside is cleaned up the outside goes along with it we don't want that and so this 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 self-righteous guy saying he's he's with those sinners he's like those sinners and jesus said let me tell you a story and then he tells them about this sheep and then he tells them about this woman and her coin and then he says and the elder brother you see it's not just the prodigal who needed to be saved it was the elder too there are two sons who are far from god the one came and the other refused the pharisees were too busy judging Jesus and those that were coming to him to see that they themselves could not rejoice when a lost person came to faith in Christ. They couldn't rejoice. This is so pointed to them. And he says in verse 31, Son, you're always with me. All that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again. It was lost and it's found. So, with tenderness, the father reasons with him, son, it's all about grace. We had to celebrate. Why won't you? To have this kind of joy, he must be blessed when the unlovely are saved by grace because there's joy when a sinner repents. And the older son, the Pharisees, was left to make a decision are you gonna to learn to rejoice when the lost are found or are you gonna stay in your hardened sense of self-righteousness? It's up to you. But there is joy in the presence of the angels of God 
when one sinner repents. And God wants us to learn to rejoice when we see that. And we do, don't we? We rejoice when someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ to see a life completely changed.